Here's what we're going to do is I'm going to ask a first question, and then my colleagues, I have two microphones, we're going to trans go around, and uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I encourage you to be crisp with your questions, so we'll let Chris have time to answer them. Um, so let me start with my first question, which is, do you see in the future, particularly in 2014, when the health insurance exchanges are up and running, that there will be strict ACO products available to people? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think that m many of these groups that are forming ACOs have an eye towards being on the exchange and or being a health plan someday. Uh, some will partner with health plans to do that so that largely it's their network, it's their care coordination, but they don't have to have an insurance license and put up all the reserves that are required to truly be a health plan. So I think we'll have people who partner with health plans but don't become a health plan. I think you'll have people that want to become a health plan um, and then either of those options could be part of the exchange offering. You know, we are, Optum actually, despite our sister company, United Healthcare, we are helping some organizations around the country, probably most notably Sutter Health in Northern California, become a health plan. We, um, I'm not sure how we rationalize that at the highest echelons of the company, but um, you know, it's something that you know, we obviously coordinate with United Healthcare. But um, you know, they ultimately will compete with United Healthcare in Northern California. But what Sutter wants to do there is is get more competitive with Kaiser. You mentioned that um, a lot of healthcare organizations are focusing on their own employees to start with. And uh, we all know that that group is a much higher utilizer. Um, are they focusing on those because of there's more opportunity there or just they, they can get a handle on it because it's their own group or what? I think, uh, I think I've heard the same thing and seen some of the same things that healthcare providers tend to be a bit higher utilizers. I think the real issue is any savings that accrues, 100% of it comes back into the pocket of the employer, which in this case is the hospital or the medical group. So. Um, I, I think it's more that, that they get to keep 100% of the dollars. It's a more contained population, uh, and it's a little uh, uh, smaller population to start with. What's the process for uh, handling providers or organizations within the ACO who aren't meeting performance standards? How do you deal with that, or what's, you know, what's I, the process? Good question. It's, it's whatever the governance processes that that ACO sets up, um, you know, typically it's not overly punitive. Typically, at least early on, it's more about data sharing, uh, looking at data compared to your peers, understanding why, if you say your cost profile is higher for the same risk-adjusted population, why is that? Are you, do you order different batteries of lab tests, imaging tests? Do you see the patients more in your office? Are your patients hospitalized more? So there's typically a a discovery process as to why that's the case. And, I, and my experience is, is that most organizations want to work with their physicians, not jettison them. So, because again, the world's still 80 to 90% fee for service. So, that orthopedic surgeon that might be out of line, if you will, from a total cost standpoint, nine out of 10 cases they do brings revenue into the hospital. So, you know, it, it's a hard thing for a, a hospital based ACO, for example. Uh, to be overly punitive. So I think what we're mostly seeing is a pretty cooperative view of sharing data and trying to get underneath what's going on. What, excuse me, what advice do you have for the medical device community who is trying to introduce new technologies into the ACO cost-driven uh, culture? Um, I think more and more, um, it, it will need to show compelling evidence of better quality or lower cost. Uh, I would say that both the pharmaceuticals and the device companies are probably in a similar boat where um, you know, increasingly people are focused on cost management. I think now um, physicians will be more and more part of that cycle in terms of helping hospitals think through how could we streamline some of the supply chain uh, if they have a very diverse supply chain with devices, that's clearly an area a lot of hospitals around the country are looking at. So I think it's going to be much more competitive for devices that are somewhat interchangeable. Uh, and if they're new devices that are unique, I think to the extent they drive quality and or 
total cost viewed very holistically, uh, they'll be well received, but if not, I think they'll struggle. What do you think is the future of, oh, excuse me, of retrospective attribution? Do you think that eventually we'll move to a model where patients choose a provider and have a in kind of narrow network type products? Um, so what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, um, attribution, um, there's this, this concept of ret retrospective or prospective. And, um, you know, I think most organizations want to know that the people they're managing and taking care of and putting resources into will be ultimately be in their risk pool and not be told later, you know what, uh, that patient actually got assigned to some other risk pool. So, um, so I see that happening. Um, I think most people, um, that makes sense to most people where a patient gets assigned and then that's where they are. I think narrow networks is another very interesting topic because again, what's driving a lot of people down this road is market share. And um, one way to drive your market share is to give a payer a cost discount but then try to drive more volume through that. Uh, we see a lot of discussion on narrow networks around the country. Uh, there's benefit plan designs that are being set up for narrow networks for key providers. So I, I see a lot more of that happening uh, probably very quickly. Some of the ones we see in different pockets of the country, providers are willing to give a maybe 10 as much as 15% price discount to get a much more aggressive benefit design that pushes volume back through their system. And that's what it's probably going to take to get employers to endorse a narrow network. Employers really are not in the business of scrunching down the network. Um, you know, if you think about it, the people that make these decisions, you know, of, at these employers don't want everybody in their office, you know, complaining about my doctor or my hospital's not in the network anymore. So I think you got to give consumers a choice. And if they choose that narrow network, you need to make it compelling to them. You know, this can't be you'll save $5 a month on your premium. This needs to be you will have no premium if you choose to go into this network. Uh, you'll have a zero premium option, but you're going to be very restricted in terms of where you can go. But we, we're seeing a lot of that. Yes. Uh, you made a comment that I thought was pretty provocative about the employer dumps uh, going to the exchanges. And I think, you know, the common thinking is that this is going to be pretty aggressive, but you said that you think it's going to be even more aggressive than people are thinking, and I wondered if you could give some additional color there. And then uh, another quick question. Um, you mentioned in the Western United States uh, that Optum owns practices, mm -hmm. and just kind of wondering what work could that go? Do you see that behavior happening with other managed care companies, et cetera? Well, to answer the second question first, yes, it's already happening. Um, the Blues in Florida just bought a clinic, Humana. I think it was Humana bought Concentra. It's happening all over. Um, and, and certain managed care organizations have that strategy and others are doing much less of it. Like, for example, I don't, I don't know that I've seen Aetna do a lot of that nationally. But um, the Blues are doing it in pockets. Um, you know, United through Optum, I'll say, is doing it and others are doing it. So yeah, we see, we see some of that and it might pick up pace as people kind of start to pick their partners and uh, some might feel like if they don't jump into that, they're gonna be left out. Um, your first question was about the employers and um, you know, will employers stay and uh, will continue to, um, will they put patients onto the exchange or retain them? I think I probably should clarify, I think in the first year, most employers are gonna be careful and they're going to watch what some of those front-running employers do and how it goes. If there's no major problems or no major issues, I think in year two and three, you could see a lot of employers uh, moving that direction. And of course, it, it, for each employer, it depends on you know sort of the cost equation. You know, there's there's a, a equation that needs to be worked out in terms of what's it going to cost me to put those people on the exchange? What is it costing me now? Do I think that's going to affect my recruiting? It's a pretty complicated set of circumstances, but I think if some major employers put people out on the exchange for their care and there's not major issues with that, I think we could see a bunch more of it. Most, most employers will be pretty cautious in the first year.
Yeah, and, and it's hard to generalize, but clearly there's some devices that will clearly improve quality, and regardless of cost, those will, those will come into play. Uh, for example, um, you know, we see there's some very expensive, ventricular assist devices are really ramping up steam. Um, you know, they keep people alive. So, you know, regardless of the cost implications, those are a quarter of a million dollars or some such thing, you do it. Um, I think when you get to something that is only giving you comparable quality, then there's going to be a hard look at, you know, what cost benefit it brings, if any, or does it add cost. And, and certainly the cost view would be very holistic, episodic, not just, you know, what does the actual device cost. Um, you, got, you guys may have seen that um, Optum announced just a week ago a partnership with Mayo called the Optum Labs, and what it largely is about is Mayo contributing all of their clinical data, Optum and United Healthcare, United Health Group contributing all of our administrative data. When you merge those two data sets, you get much richer data than either have alone. And one of the, and it's for research pur purposes. Um, and um, there will be a research committee set up to look at what studies will be done, but certainly studies around comparative effectiveness will undoubtedly be part of that. When you have clinical and administrative and claims data, you can start to look at, you know, what drugs work better for the same kinds of conditions, what devices work better. So, and they're, gonna, they're going to get other uh, partners into that consortium over time and I know they're going to look to get pharma companies, medical device companies, other providers. So I, I think the vision is to establish a very large, uh, comprehensive data set that research can be done against uh, and, and try to answer some of these questions. Uh, a bit ago, you described the world today as 80 to 90 percent fee for service. What, what, what do you see that as in 2015 or 16? I think it's market by market. Um, it could be 90 or 100 percent, you know, shared savings, you know, capitation in certain markets, uh, Southern California, for example. Um, you know, Midland, Texas probably doesn't have any compelling reason to move. So I'd be curious, I don't know what Minneapolis is at. For those providers in the room, I'd be curious if anybody's willing to step up. What percentage of your revenues are fee-for-service versus some sort of a risk basis? I don't know if anybody can answer that here. I'd, I'd be interested to know. Okay. I, I think if providers share our look on it, it's that you want to get to a certain point, then you want it to tip all the way because you're right. running parallel processes. I mean, right. even when it comes to protocols and clinical management of patient care, you do things differently. It's the whole cost versus expense is a cost center, profit center, all that kind of stuff. So it's hard to do things differently for patient streams based on what kind of contract they're covered under. So you really wanted to get to that point and then flip over. Right. My, my experience, uh, limited, and I'd be interested to hear from physicians in the room, is physicians practice one way. They don't do, cert do something this way for this patient and this way for this patient. So I think, you know, as it's been described to me, they make a transition in how they care for patients, and then they've made it. Uh, they don't oscillate back and forth. So uh, I think to your point of being 50-50, that's a tough spot to be for a long period of time. I was wondering uh, if you've seen the difference between what you're doing for the ACOs for the Medicare population versus for the commercial, are you using the same attribution models or are they using something different for commercial that might uh, look at different criteria or for your outlier thresholds? Are they generally following the Medicare guidelines or are they um, uh, customizing it more with the less regulation for the commercial? Um, as far as attribution, there's a lot of different ways to do attribution, but in general, it's where you get the majority of your primary care services. There, there's some when you say majority, do you mean number of visits or is it dollars spent? It primary? can be either. Uh, when it's a commercial payer, they may have a mechanism or a methodology they use, and maybe it's visits, maybe it's total dollars spent. It, it, there is some variation with that. Um, you know, what was the second part of your question? The outliers? Oh, the outlier using? management. So CMS, I mentioned, takes the top 1% 
So they split it into ESRD and non-ESRD. And for both groups, they trim off the top 1%. And when they trim them off, is that total elimination of all of those claims for that member, or is it truncated at a level? I, I could be wrong, but I think that member's out altogether. See, that's such a strange incentive, because then you want to push people over, because then that's all gone. Yeah, and again, as I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, well, you don't get to know what the 1% threshold is until after, fact, after the fact. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there can be some real savings opportunities in that top tier of patients. Um, there can be some real risks there, too. So depending on, you know, your point of view, you, you might go either direction on that. As far as commercial, again, there's a lot of different methodologies to do outlier trimming, and it just depends. Right. Okay. Thank you. I, I could just follow up on the attribution. In Minnesota, on the commercial, it's a look back right now, and they're trying to find some uniform standard if it's 12, 18, 24 months. Um, in the Medicare CMS, it's a prospective look for attribution, mm -hmm. so that's the main difference. Uh, my question is around infrastructure. On the care delivery side, we're building a lot more of care coordination for transitions and, you know, looking at our high-risk patients and et cetera, chronic disease. And now we see the plans offering and ramping up on care coordination and actually even wanting access to EHRs. So I'm wondering what your position is at United around that. Um, I don't know if I represent the position of United on that, but uh, I, I think... Um, one of the things that's happening is as provider systems are accumulating these types of capabilities, they want to do it for all their members because it just tends to work better. And what they'd like is to be paid by the payer to do that. And that makes a lot of sense. So then if you also have payers that have historically done some of these things, and, and I would submit that when payers do this, they're not really integrated with the clinical um, network, the hospitals, the physicians, the, the everything else. They're kind of doing it around that as best they can. They, they'd have a lot of consumer engagement, but meaningful integration with the providers, particularly the physicians, is a tough thing to get as a payer doing care management. So I think what you're going to see is employers in particular saying, well, this is all very interesting, but I'm not paying you and you to do the same thing. Um, so who can do it better? And I think the, the ball will typically fall in the provider court on that. You know, now the tricky part for a payer that's managing millions of lives with patients all over is, okay, I've got patients at Park Nicolet and they do a great job, but then I got patients over there and they don't even do care management. So keeping track of who does it, what do they do, who doesn't do anything or who doesn't do it very well and where do I need to fill those gaps, that's complicated. But that's it's kind of that's kind of where we are right now. So that's coming very quickly. Yes, sir. Now, uh, back to the attribution question, uh, behavioral question of us humans. Once patients have been attributed to an ACO, what are some of the mechanics, metrics by which the ACO manages the behavioral transformation patients need to do in order for costs and quality to be managed? I know there's money, there's control, but uh, what are the various carrot sticks? Are we back to co-pays, deductibles? Uh, yeah. What's coming to manage behavior? Well, certainly uh, if it's a commercial plan and they have the ability to adjust benefit plan design to incentivize certain types of behavior, that will and is happening. Um, you know, certainly patients paying a greater share of the cost is happening. Um, you know, at United, six years ago, they went to fully consumer-directed, and uh, that we have a choice of plans, but I have a $5,000 deductible today. Now, that's the, the most, and we all make our own choices, so I get an HSA with money deposited into it, and I make my choices about whether I want that deductible or something lower. I have the, very low pre I have the lowest premium, so I, I think the commercial plans certainly the financial incentives will continue to get tinkered with to try to incentivize certain types of behavior. I think the other side of consumer engagement is on, you know, wellness and care management and just education around how to manage your disease if it's a chronic disease. Um, some of that's happened in the past, but some of that has not happened. Uh, employ on the Medicare side, you're much more limited with what you can do from an incentive standpoint. Um, CMS really doesn't allow a lot of incentive type things to be done. Um, 
you can certainly engage the consumer and educate and talk to them, but uh, financial incentives really are not part of that. So the add-on to that would be for Medicare ACOs, leakage is a very significant uh, risk point. Yes. When you're talking to your organizations, do you have suggestions or directions that you're pushing them into to address that? Well, uh, each situation's a bit different. I would say the common element is you follow the data and then you go talk to people. So, you know, you follow that referral chain of primary care to specialists to facilities and other services. And if you, you know, if a lot of cardiology is leaking out of the system and then a lot of cardiac procedures as a result are going to hospitals that are not part of your system, you got to work backwards and figure out what's going on. Why are the primary care physicians referring to that group, which is referring to outside hospitals? And the, the answers could be, that's the way they've always referred. Um, they don't really know that to do anything different, and they didn't know it was an issue. Um, they have questions about the quality somewhere along that chain. It could be anything. But usually it's kind of a sleuthing mission of what's happening, what's leaking out, why is it leaking out. Maybe it's services that we don't even have. So would we want to bring those services in given, you know, there's $10 million of hyperbaric oxygen stuff leaking out. Do we want to, do we want to get that service in house now if we think we could capture a lot of that? So I don't have a generic answer. I think it's just follow the data and see what's going on. Last one. Go ahead. Thank you. Social predeterminants have a significant impact on both cost and quality, and they're not today in any of the risk adjustment models. And so, first of all, how are you seeing that information collected, and then how are you seeing it brought into the risk arrangement and factored into um, the shared savings model? Unfortunately, not very much or very often. Um, and, and by social, you mean level of education, housing status, all those types of things? Yeah, those are data points that are hard to come by. Um, you know, we don't have those on a lot of patients. Um, you can do HRAs and things like that to collect that information. Getting HRA type data into the, into the data stream, if you will, is, is hard. Um, so by and large, those things are not in, and those are not reflective of the risk adjustments. The risk adjustments, as sounds like you know, tend to be mostly about clinical risk adjustments, not social risk adjustments. And I think that's probably another frontier of how do you get the best risk adjustment because, you know, when people start taking risk, they'll feel better about it if they know their payments have oscillated based on, you know, that this person, you know, lives alone or this one doesn't live alone or this patient, this one is college educated and this one's not. So, and whatever that means to, you know, the ultimate cost of care, if those factors can get baked in, I think people feel better about, you know, taking payments on a risk adjusted basis, but it's largely not there today. Great. Um, I just want to comment that I think the theory of this event is uh, proven out to be correct, which is Chris has really given us a wonderful outlook about ACOs and what United is doing, and hopefully we provided some feedback from our local community to, to the United people that are here, your yeah. colleagues and many in the audience here, um, and hopefully we could do more with United into the future. I mean, I think that's exciting. We know it's a great company out there in Minnetonka. We forget about it sometimes, but we all see, we all have friends that work for United, right, don't we? So um, I have, a, here's my last question, which is um, kind of a fun question, is United uh, about, uh, I think six months ago, bought a giant healthcare system in Brazil. And, um, and so I'm curious, Chris, if you got any observations on strategy um, about why United's buying healthcare systems in the rest of the globe, and when are we at St. Thomas going to have some Brazilian students up here getting an MBA? I think Steve Hemsley wanted to learn Spanish is what it was. <laughs> um, you know, Portuguese. Portuguese. Yeah, Portuguese. So I, I, I don't, I think my opinion is that um, Back when, uh, in 8 and 9, when the U.S. economy really tanked, I think United looked at uh, their risk profile and said, we are very United States-based and oriented here. 98% of our revenue is U.S. oriented, and that's a heck of a, a business risk for a company that takes great pride in managing risk. Uh, so I think you'll continue to see international expansion of various types. Uh, we acquired a company called Email in, in Brazil, which is a health insurer. 
And I think we'll probably see more of that in some of the more developed countries. Uh, as you know, um, health insurance as a mode doesn't really exist in a lot of places. But I think it was mostly about diversification and an opportunity in a particular country uh, to have significant growth that you might not see in the US here. Thank you very much. Have a nice night home. Uh, stay warm.